Welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm your host, CEO Dan Mary Ashen. We appreciate your spending some time with us today. Joining me today is author Dan Joseph to talk about his new book, Last Ride of the Iron Horse. Dan is currently a senior editor in the Voice of America's Central Newsroom. Prior to his time at VOA, Dan spent several years with B'nai B'rith International as a writer and an editor. Last Ride of the Iron Horse is his first solo endeavor. He previously co-authored a book on African geopolitics. In his book, Dan details Lou Gehrig's final season, 1938, with the New York Yankees, as he dealt with the early effects of amythropic lateral sclerosis, or ALS, later became known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Dan and I will talk about Gehrig's last season in the Bronx and what Dan discovered about Gehrig in his research. Gehrig's open condemnation of Nazism and the Yankee legend's strong support of Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany. We'll also speak about current Jewish major leaguers like Alex Bregman and others and the coronavirus's long-term impact on Major League Baseball. Welcome, Dan. Great to have you with us today. Thanks, Dan. It's, uh, it's good to be back with uh, B'nai B'rith. Well, let's talk about the book, Last Ride of the Iron Horse focuses on Yankees legend Lou Gehrig in his final season playing baseball. And you don't have to be a Yankee fan to know about Lou Gehrig. His career was legendary, played 17 seasons, had a career batting average of 340, 493 home runs, nearly 2,000 runs batted in. Uh, the list just goes on. Seven-time All-Star, six times a member of world championship teams, uh, really uh, one of the great stars of the game. Actually, the first player to have his number retired by any team. Mm -hmm. Now, why did you decide to write about Gehrig, who's been covered pretty exhaustively in books and newspapers and film? And of course, uh, many people know Lou Gehrig by the motion picture, which starred Gary Cooper, Pride of the Yankees. So tell us about how you came to this particular subject. Well, years, this started with a thought I had actually years ago. Um, you know, Gehrig, for years, he was the engine that drove the, the Yankee uh, offense, along with Babe Ruth, of course. But Gehrig was the cleanup hitter. He was the number four guy. And I always noticed that, you know, 1938, that was his last full year in the lineup, and his numbers dropped. Uh, from their usual heights. They, he still had a pretty good season by anybody's standards, but it was it was an off year for him. And in many books and articles about Gehrig, they sort of treat the 1938 season as sort of the prelude to his downfall before ALS forced him out of the lineup. And it always occurred to me, okay, yeah, that's, the, that's true, but if somebody is beginning to suffer from ALS, which is a you know, a horrible, crippling disease paralyzes you. How in the world did Lou Gehrig manage to hit 29 home runs? How did he manage to play every game in the Yankee schedule that year and lead them to a world championship? And this had been touched on in a few articles and books, never really been examined, though. And so I thought, I, I'd like to really dig into this year and see what was going on with it. And I found just treasure troves of interviews and observations from people and film and photos and, and radio clips even uh, from that season. And it was enough to produce this whole book. And the most remarkable thing was that there was a period in August of 1938 when for just, just for about three weeks, <clears throat> Eric went back to being his old self. He had a surge of power uh, where he hit, I think there was a two week period where he had seven homers, 27 RBIs, 419. And this was the only time that year that he had that kind of surge. And it made me wonder, the, was there some sort of physical turnaround that he had during that time? And I actually talked to a doctor, um, Rick Bedlack. He's based at University and he's a researcher there, um, and he studies what they call ALS reversal, and it's a phenomenon that occasionally will happen to an ALS patient where their his his or her physical uh, condition will improve 
slightly. They'll briefly get some of their functions back or in the, 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 the unknown is, is it a result of something actually happening inside their body or is it some sort of successful adjustment to things that have already happened to their body? In Lou Gehrig's case, now I did find that the surge in August coincided with him getting new baseball bats and he adjusted his batting stance. Uh, so that's certainly possible that that could have happened. But also maybe just for whatever reason, he suddenly felt better. Maybe he felt kind of a surge of strength. Um, we don't really, we have no way of knowing for sure, but uh, I thought that was, it was, it was how much, an interesting part of the book. You know, you say, you know, he played the full season in 1938. Of course, uh, he really was Mr. Intestinal Fortitude. Um, 2,130 games, his, his streak of consecutively played games uh, lasted until 1995 when Cal Ripken uh, broke the record. Um, so do you think it was this reversal or do you think there was just this, this intestinal fortitude, can't think of another term, uh, that just drove him on, even though he, he surely knew that he was more than losing a step. I mean, I read one uh, comment by a journalist who said, look, I, I know at the time, I know when I see players from one season to the next, you can see that they've just lost it or they're beginning to lose it. But this was more than that. This, this particular journalist saw that there was something else here. So um, do you think it, it, a lot of this was just, you know, this guy really had this great uh, ability uh, to push himself? He undoubtedly had the ability to push himself. There were many, many times during his streak, which lasted over 14 seasons, that he was injured. He, I mean, there were times when he was playing with a broken thumb, uh, he played with what they called lumbago, which was just kind of a general lower backache. He played with um, all sorts of muscle pools and sometimes with colds and the flu. Um, so it's certainly possible that in 1938, as he began to feel his strength slip away, he pushed himself and made himself go out there and play. Um, and it's, it's just really, it, it always struck me as astounding that as you know, ALS, it, it, it's a progressive disease and it begins to take away, it takes away your strength, it takes away your reflexes, it takes away stamina. But, but Garrick, I, I always thought Garrick start, started on such a high level, almost a superhuman level of endurance and strength that he could, he was able to still get through this, uh, the, a grueling season. I mean, there was a stretch in August of 38 where the Yankees played I think it was six double headers in one week. And he played all 12 games. He played nine innings in all 12 games. I mean, that, that's enough to kill Superman. You know, and it was, this was all during the daytime. There were no lights. You know, he, he's, he's playing in the August heat, 12 games. Nope, but he, he did it. And he, he even hit a couple home runs that week. And uh, he was, he, it was, actually, it was during this surge period that I was talking about. So, yes, intestinal fortitude the max. Well, let's talk about the personal profile. He's born in New York City in 1903 in Yorkville, uh, which was a kind of a German-American uh, 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 enclave, or an, an actually at that time, German-American immigrants. Um, actually, parenthetically, I was also born in Yorkville, um, oh. although my family was not from, uh, from that community. Um, so his parents were immigrants to the United States. He actually spoke German until the age of five. Um, what other aspects of his life surprised you? Now, he also went to Columbia uh, for a couple of years. Yeah. As an, um, engineering, as an engineering student. Yeah. Although now, the Columbia thing, I mean, th this was a case of immigrant striving. Garrick really wasn't that interested in college. His mother was very, it was very keen on him getting a college education. And she had been working at a fraternity house on the Columbia campus. And so Garrick would, as, as a young boy, would come over there and help her wash dishes and, and, do, and uh, you know, just do her housework. And the guys in the fraternity got wind that he was a good high school player. Uh, and some, there was a connection made somewhere and they said, hey, you know, you could come and play baseball. And he, and he played football too for the for Columbia University, but he had to, you know, he had to 
kind of catch up academically, take some remedial classes, but he did get in. And uh, he stayed there for a couple of years. But it, it, it really wasn't a goal of his to become an engineer. That was very much his mother's goal. He, he wanted to be a baseball player. And when the Yankees offered him a bonus after the 1923 you know, college baseball season, he took it right away. Interesting thing. He signed for a bonus of $1,500. Right around the same time, I think it was the Red Sox signed a famous Jewish player for $5,000. That was Mo Berg. Mo Berg got three times the bonus that Lou Gehrig got. Well, um, I guess life is not fair <laughs> when you look at, <laughs> at sports salaries, but uh, the Moberg legend lives on in a, in a different way, in a much different way. And it's certainly a very interesting uh, character in, in his own right. Um, Gehrig was certainly one of the most uh, dignified athletes uh, of any era. He uh, wasn't afraid to speak the truth, a plain spoken guy. Uh, when doing your research and writing about him, were you surprised to learn that he visited Germany or he, or he appeared at events supporting Jewish refugees uh, from Hitler? I'm, I guess I wasn't that surprised that he visited Germany, but I kept, because now his parents were German immigrants. And like you said, they spoke German. And it was, he, it was a culturally German household. Um, and Derek, you know, he would befriend other people around the team who spoke German. Babe Ruth actually spoke a little German too. And uh, Fred, there's a famous sports writer, Fred Lieb, who spoke German. So Garrett was kind of, he, he stayed in the German American culture. So after the 1934 season, Ruth and Gehrig and some other players went on a, uh, an exhibition tour of Japan. And after that tour, Gehrig and his wife began a round-the-world trip. And they went to, I think, Singapore and India and Egypt and some other places. And then when they got to Europe, they went to Germany. Now, this was January of 1935. Now, Adolf Hitler had taken power two years earlier, and the Nazification of Germany was well underway. And in her memoir, years later, Eleanor Gehrig, his wife, said that they did stop in a Munich hall and Eric was able to converse with people and he did kind of get the lowdown on what was happening and he, he as she put it uh, he could tell that the Jews were in for a hard time she didn't expand she didn't expand very much on that and interestingly this tells you how much society has changed when it comes to athletes uh, when Garrett got back to the United States in February he told people he had been to Munich and his mother told people he had been to Germany but I looked around, not a single sports writer, nobody asked him, what is life like in Nazi Germany for the Jews or for just the people in general? Writer, reporters did not ask athletes back then about their political opinions. It, it, it was just, it, I don't think it occurred to anyone. Um, but it must have made an impression because three years later, three and a half years later, uh, November of 38, there was a, a group called the United Palestine Appeal uh, that was raising money for Jewish refugees fleeing Nazi Germany. And they held what they called an annual Night of Stars at Madison Square Garden. And somebody, well, let me just back up here. Now, now celebrities appearing at this, some of them would be people you'd expect like Irving Berlin, Eddie Cantor, uh, the comedian George Jessel, but then there were other people you wouldn't normally expect at this sort of thing. Orson Welles was there, uh, Jack Dempsey, the boxer. And somebody must have asked Garrett, would you like to come? And he did. And if there was ever any impression that Garrett was pro-Nazi uh, just because he was German American and parents came from there, this would have obliterated it. This did obliterate it. I mean, this was an event where they sang Hatikva and they raised the, the future Israeli flag and Garrick spoke to the audience. Now, I don't have a, I didn't find a complete transcript of what he said, but I did find one line where he said, I'm glad to live in a country where I can wear the World's Fair emblem on my sleeve. This was before the 39 World's Fair. Glad to live in a country I can live, where I can wear the World's Fair emblem on my sleeve and play baseball and not in a country where I'd have to wear the swastika. Well, let me ask you, uh, did he have, you know, playing in New York, 
playing in the Bronx in those days, um, right by the Grand Concourse. Uh, Yankee Stadium. Did he have any kind of relationship beyond what you just said about that particular rally? Um, did he have any type of relationship at all with the Jewish community? I don't really think so. I, I didn't uncover anything that suggested, you know, he was a friend of the Jewish community, so to speak. I don't think there was. I mean, he had there were Jewish fans in the stands, obviously, who admired him, but um, I mean, he he was very much focused on baseball and uh, his wife and, you know, the things they would do together. I, I, I didn't sense any greater engagement, but now definitely I, I do think whether it was the visit to Nazi Germany, something struck a chord in him because now after this rally that I um, talked about the next year, there was another rally and Eric went a second time in November of 39. And I think what's even more impressive about that is that this was after Gehrig had been really stricken with ALS and it was getting hard for him to move around. He could still walk, but it was getting hard for him to go places. But he went to the rally a second time and, and these rallies raised like $100,000 each year for Jewish refugees. And he, he, this time he said, I'm glad to be here where there are no bombs falling. There was a reference to the war having started. So, I mean, I, I, he obviously had real sympathy for, uh, for the refugees. He wouldn't go twice if he didn't. So he comes back for that 39 season, <clears throat> only 28 at bats, um, four hits. Clearly now um, ALS has taken a terrible toll at, at this particular point. And he calls it quits. Uh, he's honored at, uh, at Yankee Stadium on the 4th of July of 1939 uh, and gave that that famous speech, which echoes in every baseball fan's mind and heart. I just read <clears throat> uh, the beginning and the, and the end. He says, fans, for the past two weeks, you've been reading about the bad break I got. Yet today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. I've been in the ballpark for 17 years and have never received anything but kindness and encouragement from you fans. And then he closes. So I close in saying that I may have had a tough break, but I have an awful lot to live for. Uh, extremely touching, um, even 81 years later. Um, what happens to him on, uh, after that game, He's that, after that ceremony? Um, he, go, he lives another couple of years, um, clearly his condition deteriorating, but tell us about those last couple of years. Well, I just want to say the, the, the immediate effect of that speech was that you know, he had already been a beloved baseball player, a very popular player for a long time. But that speech turned him into a real national icon and, and turned him into the unforgettable immortal figure, I think, that we know of today. Everyone knows who Lou Gehrig is. Even if, even if you know, you're somebody who doesn't follow baseball, you've heard of Lou Gehrig, part, partially because it's ALS is often referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease, and partially because that speech is, you know, has been played so much and referred to so much. Uh, interesting thing that the day after the speech, they even ran a picture of Gehrig in the forward in New York, and they had a caption of him. Uh, the caption was in Yiddish, I believe. So, I mean, he was really, uh, he really penetrated the consciousness of everybody in America. So, after the after the speech, um, he sort of, for, for a while, he kept hanging out with the Yankees. He would still travel with the team. Even occasionally, he would take part in, like, infield practice, just, you know, just for fun. He never got into another game, obviously. And then that fall, the Yankees told him, all right, now, you know, Lou, you, you've been great to us, and but it's, it's time for you to move on. Uh, they had paid him his full salary that year, but they didn't really have another position for him. So Gehrig took a position with the city of New York as a parole officer, uh, deciding you know, whether people were allowed out of prison or not. And he actually did that for about a year and a half. Uh, he would somehow get to the office, apparently. Either he would drive himself or be driven. Um, and he would go out to prisons on Rikers Island, I think it was, and, and meet with uh, you know, rapists or drug, drug addicts and things like that. 
Um, and he found it very rewarding. Um, he, he had always had a inclination to do something more than uh, baseball, you know, when, when uh, his career ended. He, he was definitely, toward the, end, he, toward the end of his career, he was thinking ahead, what can I do next? Um, and, but he was still struggling with the disease. And uh, finally, in June of 1941, uh, he couldn't get to the office anymore. He was bedridden and he kind of, kind of quietly sl slipped away uh, at his home in Riverdale. Uh, but then a year after he died, that's when they made Pride of the Yankees. Uh, and the movie makers in Hollywood knew that his story was a good one, you know, good for a movie treatment, and uh, and they made the immortal movie, which I you're telling me. Well, you know. well, you've really uh, told a, a very interesting uh, story about a storied uh, athlete, and um, it really uh, is uh, part of the story that I think a lot of people don't think about. They know about the career, they know about the speech, uh, but all of the things that go into it and also these aspects uh, that you put in about um, Jewish community, uh, I think are, uh, will be of interest, uh, not only to Jewish fans, but to, uh, to every fan of baseball. Dan, just in the time we have left, a couple of baseball questions. Um, so many Americans and others around the globe uh, baseball is one way to escape the daily grind. We wait for it. We go through spring training. We can't wait for opening day. It takes us through the summer. It takes us through a good part of the fall. Um, how about you? What was it like for you with no baseball until uh, July 25th of 2020? Uh, and um, how has it affected you as a diehard fan? I, I missed it. I, I was so yearning for baseball some days. And, you know, like, like, like a lot of people, I went back and watched old games and, uh, I was, I'm so glad that it's back. It's just nice to have it on in the background and nice to just sit down and watch a, watch a few innings. And I hope that somehow, you know, the, they can control the, the, uh, the outbreak on the, the Marlins and just kind of keep the season going. I'll take a 60 game season, you know, it, it's fine. I just, I just want some, I, I, I want live sports back and baseball's number one in my book. Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, I'm like you, and um, even without fans in the stadium, although I know they have the, the noise background, which helps a little bit, so I, uh, I, I'm where you are. It's good to have baseball back. Um, let's talk about uh, current Jewish major leaguers. You know, in my day, it was uh, Sandy Koufax, um, a fellow by the name of Barry Latman, who pitched for the Indians and the White Sox, good pitcher, Ken Holtzman, Steve Stone. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the Sherry brothers, Norm and Larry, who, uh, who actually played uh, on the same Dodger teams with Sandy Koufax. There was even a guy who was a catcher. He was a journeyman catcher, played for the Mets and six other teams, Joe Ginsburg. These were the, these were the, the guys, the Jewish players in, in my day. Today, you've got Alex Bregman and Jock Peterson, Ryan Braun, Max Fried, and a few more, even Gabe Kapler, uh, who manages uh, San Francisco Giants, Brad Osmus, and, and, and others. Uh, in this latest wave of anti-Semitic outbursts from athletes, celebrities, politicians that we've seen on Twitter and Facebook. Um, what, uh, what responsibility do you think uh, Jews in baseball or in sports have, if any, uh, to respond to and help educate their teammates and their, and their fans uh, about anti-Semitism? I've always taken the opinion that, you know, they're not, I don't know if they're required to do that. I don't, I don't think you can require an athlete to speak out about an issue. Um, they are, they are there as, you know, entertainment for lack of a better word. However, if they are inclined to do so, if they have that motivation, I think, it, I think it's great. I think it's, um, it's, it's good that they denounce anti-Semitism. It's good that they, in, in a quiet way, I, I, I don't necessarily like in your face behavior, but if, you know, if they let people know that they're Jewish and let them know that, you know, they are the reason the team is succeeding, especially in like Alec uh, Bregman's case, um, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a fine thing. I think it's, it's good that when Jewish kids know that there are Jewish baseball players and can hope to achieve that someday or they could take pride in that uh i i certainly take note when uh bregman or freed or uh peterson 
is uh, is playing, and you know, I, I hope they do well. And I, I think uh, it's a good example for, for kids. Well, of course, then there's just um, being an example of, of being a consummate uh, ball player, or sportsman. Um, you know, you had we had Hank Greenberg before my time, uh, and those uh, who remember his playing days, uh, the important uh, uh, role that he played as a role model. Um, that certainly uh, spoke uh, legions of uh, words uh, about uh, Jews as athletes, Jews as, as Americans. In my day, it was Sandy Koufax. I, I had a very tough time in 1963 being a Yankee fan and seeing what Koufax uh, did to the, the Yankees in 1963. But we, we were very proud of uh, his uh, sitting out uh, Yom Kippur. Uh, it meant uh, a lot to us, and it, and it, it was an important message really for for others as well so uh sometimes you lead by example mm -hmm. uh and certainly in the case of greenberg and koufax who were the two greatest american uh baseball uh, american jewish baseball jewish, players. Well, if, if i if i can jump in here now hank greenberg he was actually a big admirer of lou gehrig um the yankees were recruiting greenberg when he was in high school and a yankee scout took him to a yankee game that you know at the stadium and Scout pointed at Garrick, who was having, he was struggling a little bit at the time, just a little. And the scout said, look at Garrick. He's all washed up. He'll be the Yankee first baseman in no time. Garrick, Greenberg looked at Garrick and he, he didn't believe a word of it. And that's why he signed with Detroit. And then throughout his career, Greenberg sort of measured himself against Lou Garrick. And it, it was frustrating for him because he always came up just the tiniest bit short. Great as Hank Greenberg was, Garrick always drove in like maybe one more run. And uh, for years, Greenberg couldn't get into the All-Star game because every year, Lou Gehrig was the first baseman for the, uh, for the American League. Uh, in my book, in, in Last Ride of the Iron Horse, there's actually a section of this. Green, it, it got under Greenberg's skin. Yeah. Well, there's at least one great photo I've seen of the two of them. Um, and they look to be uh, pretty compatible, even though they were competitors and rivals. Yeah. And um, that's a, a good note, uh, Dan, on, on which to end. Uh, the book is Last Ride of the Iron Horse by Dan Joseph, the story of Lou Gehrig's final season with the New York Yankees. It's available online or wherever you purchase books. Dan, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It's a great read. Yeah, you're, you're welcome, Dan, and uh, anytime. It's just, it's, it's nice to uh, see you again after all these years. It's nice to same here. Same here. Same here, thanks so much. Thanks to Dan Joseph for joining me today, and thank you for tuning in to this conversation with B'nai B'rith. If you like what you've heard, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook, and be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn about our work. For my guest, Dan Joseph, I'm Dan Mary Ashen. See you again next time on Conversations with B'nai B'rith.